I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dyker's retired. In all the previous action stories of the submarine service, it has been interesting to tell when a man stands out as a beacon for all to admire. This is the story of such a man, a submariner who before World War II had never so much as been in a rowboat. In mid-October of 1943, the USS Bowfin lay alongside her dock in Fremantle, West Australia. Having just completed her first war patrol, she was being carefully refitted. You're gonna sweat it out that much, you ought to go down there, Tully. Show them how it ought to be done. Swanson, Marty Swanson. Hey, boy, where'd you come from? It's where I'm going that's the important thing. How you been, Lou? Long, long time. Oh, you can say that again. Hey, you remember when we were... Wait a minute. What do you mean it's where you're going? Don't tell me. I got papers that say so. Real clear, transferred to the bullpen. Just like yours. How'd you know? You know me, Lou. I usually find out what I want to know one way or another. <laughs> Boy, I can't get over it together again. Lady, are we gonna make a first-class fighting pipe out of you? Well, that won't be hard to do from what I hear. It's pretty good for a first patrol. Bag 23,000 tons. Always room for improvement. You sure haven't changed any. What does that mean? Well, you're not the easiest going chief in the world, you know. Come on, Marty, just because I like a real tight boat? Sure, Lou, sure, I know, but you can be a pretty hard-nosed guy sometimes. <laughs> Look, it can be a real nice patrol. Just let the captain run the boat, huh? Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Something nice and cooling. On 1 November, final preparations for shoving off were being made aboard the boat van. Lieutenant Commander Walter T. Griffith of Mansfield, Louisiana, had just assumed command. His executive officer was Lieutenant William Thompson of Dublin, Georgia. It was Thompson's second patrol aboard the boat van. Also in their second patrol aboard were Lieutenants John R. Bertrand of White Deer, Texas, and Howard Clark of New London, Connecticut. Hey, boy, better hurry up and finish it. It'll be a long time getting mail. I'm trying not to say the same thing over and over again. That's the tough part. <laughs> I'm going to stop to figure out how many of those you've written, Johnny. Say, you counting on publishing them after the war? Making a raft of money on them? <laughs> Come on, Howard. Tell old Howie the truth now. Well, look, Howie, you know I'd never do a thing like that. Johnny, for Pete's sakes, I was only kidding. Come on. Where's your sense of humor? I'm sorry. I, I guess it kind of disappeared for a while. I know the other guys laugh at me because I write so many letters. It'd be kind of strange if you didn't. <laughs> Fella goes to sea two days after he gets married. Well, it figures he's going to spend a lot of time writing. <laughs> Mr. Clark? Swanson! Wonderful to see you aboard. Thank you, sir. Lieutenant Burton, Chief Swanson. Hi. I'm about as good a chief as they ever turned out. Thank you, sir. Uh, the captain would like to see you up on the bridge, Mr. Clark. Right now. Pretty country fair seaman. Coolest man in a rough spot you ever saw. He, I better get topside. You better finish that. Yeah. Uh, Howie? Look, I I'm sorry I was so touchy. <laughs> Don't even know what you're talking about. Give her my love. Leaving Exmouth Gulf on 4 November, bound for the South China Sea, Bofin followed a course charted along the usual route, through Lombok and Macassar Strait, Sibitu Passage and Balabac Strait. The patrol, however, was to be far from usual in any respect. That's got it. Make sure she's good and snug now. You better have them store those rags, Chief. Right after we finish the job, Mr. Bertrand. Well, somebody might slip. We always clean up after the job, Mr. Bertrand. Five of them. 
Make the gun crews happy. You don't sound too impressed. I'm just hoping for fatter pickings, I guess. We'll take them as they come. It all adds up. Come on, fire! Intelligence had learned that these innocent-looking craft in this area were being used to haul strategic material. They were fair game. The well-trained gun crews of the Bowfin were quick to pay dividends, averaging less than four minutes per target. Four of the junks were sent plunging to the bottom. The fifth tried desperately to make her escape. Captain Griffith wasn't about to cooperate. Come to new course, two, three, zero. All ahead, full. Come to new course, two, three, zero. All ahead, full. Can't outrun us. Looks like we get a clean sweep. Well, that can be a mistake, counting your chickens. Captain, did you notice some plane off the port beam, Captain? Clear the deck. Clear the bridge. chickens. Take her on down to 200 feet. Take her down to 200 feet, aye, aye. You start asking me something up there, Bill. About those targets, Captain. I never saw wooden vessels get on so fast. I can't guarantee it, but I can give you an idea why. You notice how low they ride in the water. All that and their route can add up only one way. Construction materials. And our friends are going to have a rough time using them. You feel better about the slim pickings now? You ever hear anything like it in your life, Swanson? Pick up the rags before the job is finished. Boy, these 90-day wonders, I tell you. Ooh, how many more days are you going to harp on it? The guy made a mistake. He's young. He's an officer. He ought to know. How much did you know after one patrol? You learn. You and I always did disagree about how to break in young officers. I'm just saying that looking down your nose at a sensitive kid isn't going to help anything. And I'm telling you, there's only one way with any of them. You got to hard nose them. You start babying, they ain't never going to learn. Port from starboard. Oh, Lou, let's knock it off. It's something we'll never agree on. You just make too big a thing out of it. Am I? You ever stop to think of this? Let one young officer make a bad enough mistake and a whole sub full of guys to do the paying. The hard way. Captain Griffith and the Bowfin were only warming up. On 11 November, as Bowfin entered Sibitu Passage in bright moonlight. What do you got, Bill? Tanker, Captain. Pretty good size. Ah, she'll do. Changing course. No wonder they look that big. It's two tankers. Look even better on the scoreboard. Well, it's not that easy. If we close in this kind of light, one of them will get away. If we clear the passage to wait for them, they might go in Tawi Tawi Bay, we'd lose both. Come to course 030, all ahead, full. Come to course 030, all ahead, full. We beat them to the entrance at Tawi Tawi. Maybe you can still put them both in that scoreboard. When the tankers steamed past Tawi Tawi, Bowfin was waiting. No large guns. Trailing vessels twice the size of the lead. Down scope. Captain? I think we can take them with gun action. 
probably carrying gasoline. We set them afire, we save ourselves some torpedoes. Battle stations, gun action. Battle stations, gun action. Battle stations, gun action. Don't go to fish. Guns keep getting the play. Different, same salary. Stand by to surface. Stand by to surface. Battle surfacing 2,000 yards on the quarter of the largest target. The Bowfin's gun crews went quickly to work. Commence firing! Guessed right about their cargo. Cease fire! The shore batteries will see that soon enough. We better get out of here. With the shooting over, the enemy scene changed. They were now just tragically helpless human beings. The sight affected Bertrand profoundly. Any censoring it? Hmm. Nothing to censor. Something to talk about, though. Burke Howie, I'm tired. I want to just listen, have... Johnny. Just listen. And it's the one thing I can never quite get out of my mind. Am I really good officer material? Sure, darling, I am one, but do I deserve it? Howie, give it to me. And I can't even answer it honestly because of the others, because they're so different. They can laugh, joke, throw anything off. They realize what has to be done and do it, but not me. I'm still full of self-doubt. I still can't watch a man die without dying a little myself. I keep thinking I'm just a school teacher who somehow got his stripes. Now, you've known it a long time. Don't look so surprised. Only surprised that a bright guy could be so blind. Johnny. They don't make many mistakes when they give out those stripes. Believe me, they didn't make one with you. Well, you ask Tully, the stupid mistake I made with him. You ask him. You're making a bigger one right now. Howie, look. Johnny, you said it all right here. Everybody's different, and they have a right to be. So you're a quiet guy, a gentle guy. Fine, but don't go reading things into it that aren't there. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Oh, so what? You're a submarine officer, and a good one. You don't have to convince anybody. No, only myself. More than one member of the Bowfin's crew was later to refer to it as the Banana Patrol, for the targets seemed to come in bunches. A bare 36 hours later, Bowfin moved slowly through a dense, shifting fog. Radar contact, bearing 030. Two of them, Captain. Uh, we might just as well be in a blanket. Another contact, same bearing. Left, full rudder. Port back, emergency. Starboard ahead, full. Left, full rudder. Port back, emergency. Starboard ahead, full. Suddenly, the truth was plain. In the tricky shifting fog, both men had wandered into the midst of a five-tanker Japanese convoy. The attack would be difficult enough, but the limited visibility and an improperly tuned radar containing a blind spot complicated the chore beyond belief. Griffith was a skillful, well-trained commanding officer, however. After an hour and a half of tracking, he was well aware of the disposition of his target and directed his approach on the leading vessel in the starboard column.
All torpedo tubes ready. Final bearing and shoot. Bearing. Mark, 110. Shoot. Bar two. Bar three. Three fish, three hits, and the climbing flames easily identified the cargo. Oil. The second vessel in line wasn't that easy, for the burning tanker had veered broadside, perilously close to the bow fin. It took more time than he liked, but Captain Griffith did some fast maneuvering, got into position, and used three more torpedoes. shooting, Captain. And we paid for getting that second one, though. Gave the others a chance to get away. Still comes out one way to me, Captain. They did all the pay. Something for you, Mr. Clark? I think so. Calls for listening mostly, just listening. Come on, Marty. Who's making too big a thing of it now? I just don't think you're doing a very good job of hiding your feelings about Bertrand, Lou, and I think it's wrong. Funny. I always figured you for a smart fellow. Now, wait a minute. Well, you sure don't need a medical degree to know one thing. No man can be any different in his background, not even you. Lou, Burton was anything but tailor-made for Navy. He was a farmer, a teacher. He'd never been on water in his life, not so much as on a rowboat. You know, to this day, he's never been able to lick seasickness, and yet he's never missed one minute's duty because of it. Now, to me, he adds up to a lot of guy, plenty of guy. I think you're way out of line. What do you mean, not even you, about no guy being different in his background? And it works the same for you as it does anybody else. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about Lou Tully, the best chief I know. But a guy whose kid brother was killed just before he was about to become an officer. And that's why Tully is a hard nose, because he wants every other officer to make it up to him. You know it's wrong, Lou. All the way around. By the time the bowfin had arrived at a position off Cape Varela, three more vessels had tasted her torpedoes. A 5,000-ton freighter, an escort vessel, and a cargo-laden coastal steamer. I should score aboard now. Fat, Captain, and probably get lots fatter. Got a radio message from the billfishes, another convoy in the area. Five ships again and big. They can't hurt my feelings that way. Two and a half hours of skillful tracking, and Captain Griffith had overtaken the convoy. The vessels were fully as big as he had expected. Driving in on a surface attack, Griffith used four torpedoes and four minutes to sink the largest of the vessels. Only two well-aimed fish were needed to put the second vessel under. The third vessel had gotten within 500 yards, however, and poured a stream of gunfire at the submarine. It's a lot closer than I wanted. Shade right off the after deck. Let's get him before he gets any luckier and blows our stern off. We'll take him with a stern tube setup. I'm gonna 
new course 090. Barry. Barry. What's the Barry? Let me have that Barry. Bearing 270. Fire 7. Fire 10 to yours fast enough, how come you take your sweet time with mine, huh? I'm sorry. I tell you, son, any more days like yesterday and we'll break every record in the world. Three out of that time, boy. And those last two were dead ducks for sure if we hadn't had prematures in the last two fish. I tell you. Now, what's this? Uh, a letter. Now this, and, and Honey Skipper says he's recommending Johnny Bertrand for the Silver Star. Says he's as gutty a man as he's ever known. Well, I should think you'd look a lot happier than that, buddy boy. Well, he's wrong. I'm gonna tell him just how. And, sir, I, I was just plain scared. As scared as a man's ever been. So you figure you don't deserve the recommendation? No, sir. A man who's gonna teach ought to know a lot more about people. Well, what do you mean by that, sir? You run into a man who said he's never scared. You're either talking to a fool or a liar. You know, bandages and wounds don't make heroes. The man that knows what he's facing, and yet faces it, that's hero enough for me. Well, that's, that's generosity, Captain. It's also practical. You know, there were shells dropping all around back there, yet you went back on that TBT and you gave us bearings. And without them, we never could have nailed that ship. Why don't you go back there and write a letter, son? I hear you're a pretty good hand at it. Yes, sir. I think I'll enjoy writing this one, sir. I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. And now I'd like you to meet Rear Admiral Walter T. Griffith, retired, the real skipper of the submarine boat fan. Walt, it certainly didn't take you long to turn a scholarly farmer into a real fighting man. Well, John Bertrand was a brave man long before I ever met him. I don't know whether heroism is born of an occasion or occasions give birth to heroes. But whatever the case, John Bertrand's courage was certainly adequate. What has he done since the war? He's gone back to his first love, the field of education. He's now the president of the Berry Schools and College at Mount Berry, Georgia. I understand your submarine was awarded the presidential unit citation for that patrol. Well, we did give them a run for their money. To that, I think the audience will heartily agree. Congratulations to you and the ship's company of the Bowfin on the splendid results of your gallant second patrol. Thank you, Tommy. Please join us again for another true and exciting chapter of the silent service. Underneath the sea, the rig for dive and 
Down, 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 down